Hi, everyone. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure how much everyone is familiar with kind of our research over the last few years. Um, we kind of are working in broadly in this field that we kind of call crypto economics, which is applying mechanism design to distributed systems problems. We basically want to use like incentives to take distributed systems and secure them and make them available to the public internet. Um, kind of like Bitcoin did for consensus, but for all sorts of types of problems. And basically, out of this research, you know, has come a bunch, a, bu a bunch of different work, and like one of which is like proof of stake, right? Where we want to kind of apply, you know, uh, kind of reasoning about economics and incentives and mechanism design, which is like the design of incentive systems to uh, consensus protocols. And we've come out with like a, a whole, a whole bunch of results from our research, and um, you know, I think today we're going to give you kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a current state of the kind of art like or slash bleeding edge uh, and 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 talk about ma and maybe feel like any questions that you have uh, so proof of stake is specifically you know a problem about consensus which is a kind of very difficult thing and about like you know incentivization and mechanism design which is also a very difficult kind of thing and so you know things you know we might get in into the weeds um, but you know if you have if you have a question that you don't think will, you know, derail too much, like please go and ask. Um, so, you know, I would say that, like, kind of uh, nominally speaking, the way we're kind of talking about a lot of this, uh, a lot of Casper stuff now is we're talking about, you know, Casper the friendly what? Because there's like different things that are coming out of it, and so we have kind of kind of Casper the friendly finality gadget, which is kind of what Carl spends a lot of time implementing on on Pi Ethereum nowadays. Um, and it's kind of the first part of our rollout plan. And this basically is a overlay on top of a blockchain that finalizes the state of the blockchain so it can't be reverted. Um, and then a, a, a lot of my research focuses on uh, these, these kind of um, correct by construction consensus protocols that are designed to have like asynchronous safety and certain, um, certain properties, um, you know, in, in, ter in, term in terms of uh, the safety proof that they, that they, that they satisfy. Uh, and, and I kind of, you know, have worked on a few, like, you know, I have like Casper, the, uh, the friendly binary consensus protocol, Casper, the friendly ordinal consensus protocol, Casper, the friendly ghost, and now I have like a new one, uh, Casper, the friendly arbitrary rewrite system replication. Uh, not that, you know, that's a great name yet. Um, Vitalik also has this great result that I think, I think is like a significant contribution to consensus literature that shows how to uh, rotate validators in real time very, very, very quickly and with the safety proof. Um, um, and, and so kind of those are kind of high level, some of the stuff that we've done on the consensus front. Um, uh, and then tying consensus to economics is kind of a tricky thing um, because like the consensus protocol space corresponds to like the strategy space for the, 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 the various players. Normally consensus protocols are defined in terms of like a certain fault tolerance assumption. Um, and, 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 and you know, we, we to some extent we, we we also do that, like as in the fin finality gadget, but we have to make sen make sure that when there are faults, that we know who's done them, right? We care kind of deeply about fault attribution. We want to know that when there is a fault, we know exactly who uh, committed the fault, and uh, in order to make sure that, like, say, if there's an attack, people who are guilty pay the cost of in their lost deposits, and it's kind of the security model, right? So now I'm kind of moving a little bit, I'm slowly moving from like proof consensus stuff to talking about more like incentive stuff, right? So the way proof of stake works in like the security deposit world is you place a security deposit to participate. Maybe you have to queue up first and get selected out of a, or select, get selected out of a pool. But eventually you end up in this game where you're kind of playing the consensus game. You know, you're trying to come to consensus with everyone. And, uh, you know, if you, if, if, if you observe to behave in a faulty way, that's going to lead to some penalties, which is going to mean, like, some loss of your security deposit. 
And the security model basically is that like a normal case, we kind of pay interest for like normal baseline, like all honest nodes, like very minimal loss in security deposits. But when uh, an adversary comes along and like attacks the network, they end up creating a lot of faulty behavior and end up bearing a very large cost themselves. And so this kind of shows you a big asymmetry between you know, proof of stake and proof of work, where proof of work people are always consuming more than the attacker ever might, as opposed to here we're consuming a little bit, and then the attacker could uh, spends a lot of money when they attack. And so somehow, this is like the high level picture. You know, you place security deposits, you, you detect deviations from the consensus protocol, you get penalized for them, um, you know, for a whole bunch of different consensus protocols. Uh, and so, so now, like, you know, I'm gonna pass the mic to Carl, and maybe we'll get some updates or something. So before, we will get some updates, but first disclaimer, I just had two wisdom teeth removed, so please bear with my, oh man, so I do need the mic, dang it. Okay, I'm gonna try to speak really loud and not rupture, get a dry socket. However, um, the, the other thing is I just wanted to ask a question to Vlad, which is commonly asked, and I think it's an interesting result, which is um, why are we using security deposits and then taking them away versus like rewarding behavior? Right, so in other words, you can have like a consensus protocol where people are coming to consensus because they're continually being rewarded for coming to consensus, or you can have a consensus protocol which has some kind of you know, security deposit which can then be taken away and you know, if they don't come to consensus. Right, so like, I, I think it's an it's, you know, interesting little tidbit which you kind of mentioned. Sure, um, so basically for any given fixed amount of revenue, I can make a, like a protocol that uses deposits that is like kind of strictly speaking more robust than one that doesn't use deposits for like the same amount of revenue. And so to me, like you know, if you if you say how much revenue you want, I can like say, okay, we'll provide deposits to earn it, and it's like somehow more robust. Um, and, and and you know, um, I I, th I think I risk sometimes getting caught in some jargon. Um, uh, and so I think I think maybe like you know we should take a step back and see um, whether people. Uh, you know, whether people like understand certain terms and maybe we can like define them um, so, so that maybe, maybe we're, ha have a little more grounding. Um, so, here, so here's kind of a question. Do, do people know what we mean when we say something like um, uh, consensus finality or like a finalized block? Who thinks they really know for sure what we mean? Um, who, who knows for sure they don't know at all? Okay, so we're not, we're not doing that badly. Uh, so, so basically, uh, there's, there's traditionally consensus protocols, you know, in consensus protocol literature, we don't talk about finality. Instead, we just have this notion of decision where like a node decides on a value and somehow whenever a node outputs a value, it's kind of a final decision. And, all, and the safety property that consensus protocols normally have is like any two nodes that are following the protocol will output the same decision. And that's kind of like the trademark of consensus, traditionally speaking. Uh, but blockchains kind of, kind of, you know, didn't do this, right? Blockchains had these kind of, these things that aren't really quite decisions, they're more like estimates or guesses that maybe will be reverted later if you see like some more proof of work chain. And, 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 and when we're talking about finality in the blockchain space, what we're really talking about is like, the same thing that consensus protocol researchers normally call decisions. Namely, they are like uh, commitments to values of the consensus that are not going to be reverted by that node ever. And so to understand finality, you have to understand that finality is somehow foremost a subjective decision for that your node will not revert behind some block. Imagine if you reprogrammed your Bitcoin node to say like, after six confirmations, I will never revert. Like I'll never accept any block, any blockchain that has more than like, you know, or that starts from, a, from more than like six blocks down. Um, now, now your node will be making these like kind of decisions, like kind of irreversible decisions, and you would have finality. However, you know, whenever you have finality, there's this, there's this risk that's called consensus failure, where maybe two nodes will make different conflicting decisions. Um, and, and, then, and, and then, you know, um, we, we kind of have thro throw around this notion of like economic finality, which I know that uh, Carl wants to talk about. Sure, so um, the, we have this concept of economic finality. And so I, um, basically, the, the, the one-liner that uh, actually credit Vitalik for this is that economic finality um, is basically that you cannot revert 
changes um, in the blockchain state, you know, like you can't revert the history without paying some really high cost, right? So it, it basically costs a lot of money to revert the history. And, and you know, you can, there's, some, there's some clear intuition why this is the case um, or why we would want this. Because essentially, if we're using the blockchain as a shared distributed ledger, we don't want our history to suddenly change, right? You don't want, like, suddenly Napoleon didn't lose Waterloo or something like that. You want <laughs> to make sure that your history is consistent. So Casper is uh, very different from Bitcoin in that Bitcoin does not actually have any built-in guarantees around economic finality. So what Vlad was just talking about where um, you, know, you could have it in your Bitcoin node that after six confirmations you'll never change. So that's like you know, your choice, but it would require a hard fork to make that, those rules, well, maybe soft fork, but make those rules um, you know, kind of widespread, that everyone agrees on that. So instead, Casper actually has, and that would provide some kind of like finality, but that wouldn't even be economic finality. That would just be kind of weird. Um, but really what's happening in Bitcoin is you can actually revert any history as long as there is a longer proof of work chain, right? And with Casper, that is not the case. In Casper, if you were to change your, the history, aka equivocate, then you will lose, uh, there will be at least one third of the validators' deposits get slashed. So I don't, you know, there's not gonna be enough context for that, but just like the general idea of like you will lose money. And like the reason why Bitcoin doesn't have economic finality is because there is, it requires a budget to change the history, right? So it requires mining a bunch of blocks, and so it does require some kind of budget, but it doesn't actually incur any economic cost to revert the history. That is like the key difference, right? So there is, a, there is an explicit cost in the protocol for Casper. So the, the sense in which it doesn't require a cost in Bitcoin is that you can be profitable and conduct a double spend. So like if you have a majority coalition, you can you know, mine a lot heavier chain and revert some blocks at, at a kind of at, a, at an economic kind of gain, um, and and you know, uh, so an, an, e even if you say believe that a, no adversary will ever have more than fifty percent, somehow six blocks is doesn't isn't actually that mo that high of a cost compared to say something like uh, something on the order of the total amount of deposits placed for the same amount of revenue. Um, so you would imagine like twelve and a half bitcoins per block as revenue for like as interest on deposits, like that's potentially like a ginormous amount of deposits. Um, and like, I you know, I hope no one ever pays that much for, for consensus because I think at some point, uh, you know, you, if you pay too much for security, it becomes a security racket. Uh, and I think that's kind of like a, a, con a concern. So like, in, 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 in one of the things we argue about is like how, you know, to, to, to like how much security is enough security, like how much we wanna pay for security, you know, like cause people have different appetites for failure. like. I'm kind of relatively happy to have the consensus protocol fail because like we understand the failure modes and we can recover. And if and imagine if like okay, we we choose between like uh, paying a hundred hundred times more and having a failure every like six years or paying a hundred times less and having like one every like six months, you know, somehow there's a big it's a big factor there. Like it would be maybe nice to say like to have a big discount. Uh, and so we kind of we do we do kind of argue about some of the you know, how much we should, how, like, what is, what should be the cost of consensus. But in terms of, like, the basic principle that, like, you know, um, when consensus failure happens, there needs to be a huge amount of, like, security deposits lost. I think it's kind of very much, like, you know, uh, I mean, we all, we all very, very much agree on that. Um, and, and, you know, so, so I kind of tried to tell you that, like, finality as it relates to traditional consensus protocols and now kind of as it relates to the economics of, of this kind of proof of stake protocols, um, where basically, like, instead of thinking just about, uh, say, like the number of faults, we think about the amount of like cash that needs to be lost. So that's that, that's kind of like maybe some key terms. Um, another another kind of interesting um, uh, key key kind of concept is uh, that of like griefing and non-attributable faults. Um, so there's, there are fundamental limits to the attribution of faults in a distributed system. You can't always know, and if Alice was meant to send a message to Bob, whether, and it didn't appear to have happened, whether it was Alice who, who failed to send a message or whether Bob 
and received a message and omitted it. And so we basically have this kind of fundamental limit to, to the attribution of certain types of Byzantine faults. And this means that if we want to penalize these faults, um, that we're going to have to sometimes penalize people who you know, may not have done it. Um, and and, and, and so, so we kind of have this, this interesting trade-off where if we want to have any kind of robustness against, um, against like an adversary that, is, that can bribe our, our participants, then uh, we have to introduce some amount of unfairness with respect to uh, people getting penalized even though they're, they're, they're kind of uh, acting in good faith. Uh, so it's it's ki it's kind of like you know uh, when an elementary school teacher holds the whole class and penalizes the whole class one because they, they when they won't fess up as to who you know put the gum in the in her glass you know uh, it's it's effective it's an effective deterrent uh, but uh, you know it's 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 also like you know some students feel like it's unfair and so we have this trade off and it ends up being a super interesting trade off because basically fewer security deposits will show up if you hold them more to account for behavior that uh, may not be actually their, their, their fault, right? Um, and, uh, but if you don't hold them to account at all, all of a sudden you have this scenario where uh, censorship is free, actually, because like if we can't tell if these nodes who are offline have been censored or, have, or are just offline in good faith, you know? And so somehow, um, uh, or like, you know, on, of their own accord, as opposed to being appearing to be offline because they're being censored by the cartel. And so we, can, you know, we kind of need to choose between uh, penalizing the cartel and between, uh, you know, or, or, and if we do that, that sorry, if we, if we, or, and not penalizing them. If we don't penalize them, there's no security. But if we do penalize them, then suddenly an adversary can say, take some control of a minority of nodes, take them offline, and penalize everyone else. And that's kind of introducing this kind of unfair factor where, where you think, the protocol thinks you're censoring, but really you're not. And so you kind of get penalized, right? And so it turns out that like we can, in, in, in like any adversary, in like a particular class of adversary models, we can optimize this trade-off in order to like maximize the robustness of the protocol. Um, and so that's actually another key term, uh, ro the ro robustness. So, ro so um, we talk, so sometimes we talk about, well, let's, let's talk about stability first. So th now we're, talk this is, we're talking about kind of like more mechanism design game theory notions. So, so like, uh, we're going to say that like a cryptoeconomic kind of protocol is stable if following the protocol is an equilibrium under some notion, perhaps like Nash equilibrium or strong Nash equilibrium or perhaps some other notion of equilibrium. So, uh, and then the next one is kind of robustness, which has to do with uh, how big of a perturbation to the payouts can the protocol withstand while still being in equilibrium. Um, and, 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 and so basically, if the, a highly robust protocol, you need to spend a lot of money to, to change the equilibrium. Um, and, and, and what we want, or there's kind of this great result that says that, like, you know, um, in an incentive model for people to uh, deviate from the protocol, um, there has to be an external, external incentive at least the size of the robustness. So somehow the robustness places, like, a minimum amount that must kind of be spent by an adversary in order to uh, compromise the protocol. And so maximizing the robustness maximizes the size of the extra protocol incentive required to undermine protocol guarantees. And so somehow we can pull against, pull away from extra protocol incentives just by looking at the robustness without actually thinking about explicitly what is going on extra protocol. Um, and so, you know, except for, outside, except for in our adversary model, which may, may involve stuff like a distribution of, like, um, interest rates, which validators will except, i.e., for it to be individually rational for them to participate. Um, so that we can kind of model the fact that like fewer of them will show up if we penalize more. Uh, and so somehow there's like this ideal attack uh, where basically the attacker, what they do is they, they first, they enter the market and they, and, they, and they operate at a loss in order to make everyone else operate at a loss. And then when the size of the market gets smaller, they kind of jump in and, ta and, have, and have like a huge, huge control, like, you know, super majority and then execute their like, censorship attack or whatever, whatever they're kind of up to. And this actually turns out to be like a relatively universal kind of attack. Like you can pull this attack off on like any cryptocurrency where people have significant expenses because like you, know, you can operate at a loss, make them operate at a loss, you shrink the mining pool until you get to a point where you, know, you have a majority and, and you don't actually necessarily need to incur that big of a loss to do this. Um, it, it can actually be a super, super efficient attack. And you also see it kind of in, you know, 
economies outside of the of cryptocurrency where people where if people will engage in kind of um, competitive pricing or anti-competitive pricing more like where they'll kind of operate at a loss in order to push their out their competitors out of the market um, in order to, uh, in order to like be able to take a majority majority of the power in the market and so we have like a similar attack model here and we want to like kind of so so kind of like take this uh, take this attack model and try to maximize our robustness against it in order to parameterize this, these kind of payouts. So that's like one way. That's like kind of the max payout way. Uh, but Vitalik actually has this other type of analysis that he calls griefing factor analysis. What he prefers to do is to kind of like maximize maximize security, but also not keep the unfairness too bad. Because mm -hmm. Vitalik cares quite a, uh, quite a lot about fairness, and I think so do many, many people. Uh, and so we can measure fairness by looking at these things called griefing factors. So gr a griefing factor refers to kind of how much I can lose, how much money I can lose in order to make you lose money. Uh, so if I, like, to make, to, if I lose a dollar, how many dollars can I make you lose? Um, and it's kind of a, a pretty uh, important notion because it is very related to this attack where you try to drive people out by m operating at a loss. Um, so griefing factor, so, so you, the, the other thing we can do is say, choose the griefing factor bound that we, we want and then maximize robustness. Um, so uh, basically, you know, so these are these are like some some of the key terms. We we have like you know more, um, but I feel like I should open up the, open the floor up to question to questions and see see how everyone's feeling about this so far. So the question is, with validator set rotations, how do we penalize people who claim to be different people but are actually one? Sure. Um, so basically, there is no like inbuilt civil resistance, right? So like a a a large staker could technically, you know, own ninety percent of all ETH or something, open, you know, become a bunch of different validators, break their things up into one percent chunks, and then you know, have maybe thirty-four percent of their valid their their security deposit chunks um, equivocate, right? So basically, the 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 really what should happen probably is uh, like you should see um, someone who wants to equ equivocate will equivocate with the minimum amount of loss possible, um, and so with with that kind of your your comment in mind, that's kind of Evidence that it probably will happen around 34 percent, right? Or, or, or uh, I mean, uh, 60, 67 percent. Um, 34 percent would be the amount uh, slashed. Um, yeah. Another thing we should probably say about validator rotation is that kind of what ends up happening is that each val uh, like each validator set kind of si uh, like the current one and the next one sign off on the transition. Um, and each of them, even after you're signed off, like your deposits are kind of held for a while. And so, if there's evidence that you ma behaved badly, uh, that appears kind of after a delay, you could still get you can still get penalized. It's not like the moment you rotate out, you're you're kind of scot free. Um, it, it, it's more like they need to each sign the kind of validator rotation event, uh, but it ends up being the same block. Uh, but they don't need to technically sign all of them, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, essentially, okay, so the way the validator rotation works really quickly is essentially that you can, you can read up on exactly why this is the case in the blog post, a dynamic validator rotation um, by Vitalik. But essentially, the, the kind of intuition is you need two blocks to be finalized in a row to have the validator set switch. So if you're so yeah so essentially what that means is like your block needs to be aware that the previous epoch or epoch um, that that previous epoch was finalized that's why and and you need they also that the your your epoch also needs to know that th that epoch is finalized and the reason why that is the case is because you don't want here's what you don't want you don't want two different validator sets being able to like kind of be created 
and then fork the network, and then you don't know like which fork to choose. And you don't have the ability to attribute which one is the actual like equivocating validator set. Right? You need the ability to, to, to you know, be attributable. Um, and so what that means is you just need that like two in a row finality. So there's kind of like a mutually consenting handshake where they kind of, uh, you know, it's clear to everyone that this is, that the torch is being passed and like everyone signs off on it and like there's no way for someone to like kind of say later that the torch is passed in a different way without kind of being shown to have like kind of lied about, lied about the process. Um, so any more questions? I mean, there should be, there should be more questions. Yeah, so the question was, uh, how much does behavioral economics inform our research? And basically, um, you know, we, I mean, I've personally been reading about behavioral economics like quite a lot over the last like four months, uh, especially, because like I noticed that it's like a kind of part of the debate. And I kind of, so the, there's, there's a few ways that it's interesting. Like one of them is like, you know, there are a bunch of interesting results that will affect kind of whether humans decide to play the game. Um, but there is also a way in which behavioral economics is kind of a little bit further removed from our setting than is kind of usually the case. Because what we're asking people to do is to like run software without modifying it, which is behaviorally, it turns out, the like, easiest way to get someone to run software. Uh, and, 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 if they, and, and we kind of also have to make it so that if they modify the software, they'll be less profitable. And so it's kind of, and, and we kind of like try to show that, and so that like they don't even bother to modify the software. But basically somehow, because so the software is proxying their behavior, you know, the, the place where the behavioral stuff really matters is the, 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 the step where they decide whether or not to run the software. The step where you decide whether or not to be a validator. Not so much the question of whether, how your validator behaves. Uh, and, 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 but, you know, more broadly speaking, um, you know, I think behavioral economics is super important for mechanism design, and I think people really underappreciate the kind of, um, Ease of use requirements for mechanism design in, uh, in you know in Ethereum smart contracts. Like people design mechanisms that are really complex and have no you have no real reason to, to believe that behaviorally it's going to work out. Even though I mean in some kind of rational model uh, you may have some result. So I think that you know as like a general point for the crypto space, like looking at behavioral economics is great. As from the point of view of like the lower level blockchain protocol, where you're not really asking people to make sophisticated choices, just you're, you're just asking them to like run a, run some software and like keep it online. Um, I think it, it maybe matters a little bit less. So maybe something for something like um, for something like maybe uh, a prediction market, it would maybe matter a lot more than for something like say um, a market for uh, you know renting out your storage space. Uh, because like renting out your storage space doesn't require that you really make any decisions with the switch, whereas like the prediction market requi requires that you like make judgment calls and somehow maybe default and weird user experience quirks might lead to behavioral things. Also, like you know, there's like these effects about low probability events. Yeah, one one thing to like add on, not necessarily exactly related to the question, but um, generally speaking, like the the I, the the focus of writing these smart contracts should be in like designing good mechanisms and thinking about like economics and doing this you know crypto economics um, uh, you know applied crypto economics essentially right so you you're going to be defining mechanisms and these the reason why you have to think about it as like I'm defining mechanisms rather than I'm writing some software it's because the actual implementation of your mechanism is not going to be that difficult, right? It's, you really have to consider it as like, I am defining legislation for, you know, large uh, companies, right? That's more like uh, similar to the kinds of thought processes that you have to go, you know, go in considering um, rather than like, oh, how do I, you know, iterate over a loop really efficiently? Um, so more questions? Yeah, so why can't validators provide a proof of censorship? 
Well, it kind of has to do with the kind of fundamental limits to um, the attribution defaults that I was kind of talking about earlier. So basically, at the end of the day, there's no way that like censorship can be can be identified uh, can be distinguished from like extreme delays. Um, and so you know, but but if you if you allow yourself some synchrony assumptions, then all of a sudden some of these proofs can start to shape up, and you can start to be like, okay. If you manage to post a hash of the pre-image of something that, like you know, somehow maybe that will help you show that you um, that you were that you, that you were censored. Um, but um, the other thing is that genuinely, these things are quite hard. It's it, it basically locally you can tell, you might be able to tell uh, that like, oh look, my transaction isn't getting in. But from the point of view of a, of a smart contract in the blockchain, uh, you only get access to transactions that get in. And so somehow they, you're kind of really, really limited in, in a fundamental way. But you know that said, I think there are lots of av interesting avenues for using cool crypto tricks and stuff. But basically, we also have to make sure that like we don't spend a lot of time on like complex protocol features when like there's still work to do on like more core questions. But but you know, uh, censorship resistance is really tough and interesting. Uh, what maybe perhaps one of the more interesting ways to, to solve it is to use like some kind of time lock crypto thing, where like ev imagine if everyone were to use time lock crypto for publishing their transactions, their transactions would get in encrypted and then later create an obligation to process them by the validators after the time lock runs out. Uh, and if everyone does it, it's hard for the validator to kind of know how to censor them in a targeted way. But that's kind of like a crypto application rather than an economic one, and it's also something where it's going to delay everyone uh, because everyone has, to, and it's going to cost all this like proof of work essentially that's required for time lock crypto. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just hard. And uh, but you know, if there was anything really obvious and easy to do, I, I think we would we would we would really we would know. It may, but if it, but I, I hope you know uh, that's how you probably want to anyway. Because you have ideas. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I have been. Yeah, so so the question is, uh, how does how does like uh, the extra protocol incentives like so maybe like a double spend affect the analysis for the security? And basically, there's there's kind of two two kind of layers. One of them is to say that like you know uh, like just like kind of we were saying earlier with respect to the robustness, like as long as the incentive is smaller than that, then it's fine. Uh, and if it's bigger than that, then like kind of we don't know, and then we might have a, an, an issue. And this kind of is like fundamentally going to be a problem for stuff like uh, these class of non-attributable faults, which we call liveness faults. Um, it, it's going to be kind of impossible to, to do any better than that. However, for uh, finality, uh, we can do really a lot better. Uh, once 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 something's been finalized, uh, there's like you know you don't really get to double spend that. I mean, like kind of by definition, uh, like you can't convince these nodes that they to accept anything else. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. And so after finality, the, the, the analysis changes completely. Basically, it has more to do with, um, w w like, I mean, basically at that point, what you have to do is kind of uh, partition the network, show some people one version of history, and other people the other version of history, so that later when the social consensus kind of discovers that there's been a, a consensus failure, they fork to the one that you want. And so you kind of need to, like, seed it, seed disagreement in the community about which is the finalized state, and then tip it in your f in the f in order to you know kind of do your double spend, and so you so we're talking about um, uh, to 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 attack finality. We're really talking about uh, an attack that's like kind of m uh, uh, more than just uh, spending money in the protocol attack, right? We're talking about kind of a um, extra protocol decision about how consensus failure is managed. Because the only way for you to, say, convince someone that their money is finalized and then have it unfinalized is to cause consensus failure, which requires extra protocol uh, kind of boot for at least like some half of the network. And somehow you have to kind of hope that the community won't go against you. And basically what ends up happening is then if you have to do a super massive transaction, like way larger than like the total mass amount of deposits, then you would wait not just for in-protocol finality, but also for 
extra protocol consensus in the community about the fact that we all see the same finalized state. Because if you can get that, then the probability of someone being able to set up a situation where um, the community disagrees about which is the finalized state that they observe first and they pick the other one is much smaller. And so basically, if, if, if you wait for in protocol finality and then like chat up your friends, um, then you know you're 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 looking really good in terms of and like in terms of like arbitrary budgets being spent to what you're supposed to do, and so after finality, you know you're doing you're, it's great. But 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 if if you're saying like okay, I'm trying to tr do like a clear uh, like a billion dollar transaction, and it like net it just doesn't get in, like that can happen because like maybe the incentive to delay that transaction is higher than the um, robustness of the censorship property, and censorship doesn't have this kind of neat subjective finality kind of uh, property. And one, one quick thing to add is actually this is where like lightning networks or some kind of like value being held off chain and then settling on chain, this is where like some of the limitations start to be shown, right? So if you have some real reason to censor the, the settlement on chain, then you can you know, cause havoc. Um, but one good thing is that in, the, you know, in your smart contracts, you can just say, once there is Casper the friendly finality gadget and further iterations, you can just say, hey, has the blockchain been finalized for this transaction? Okay, it has, then you know, good, we're, we're set. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh well, uh, you know he's trying to make this a show. He's trying to make this a showdown, but I won't. But, but I won't let him. We we worked on different stuff. I mean, you know, we're, we we I don't know. Do we have deep philosophical disagreements, Carl? Generally not. I'm a huge fan of Lad Hardfork to you know save the world and like I think and and mechanism design and you know all that kind of stuff. Like I got into proof of stake a large part because of Lad, also Vitalik, and like you know. Mainly because of Vlad, let's be honest, um, and so not really any disagreements. Maybe the only difference is is like I am more of like implementer and you know aspiring to to you know write some research papers. But you know we got to get kind of stuff done, so I'm like trying to get it through. And Vlad is you know researcher and going ham, but I can let him speak for himself. Yeah, no, I think Carl pretty much said it all. Anyone else? back. So I didn't mean you, Christian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar. All right. So the qu the qu so so the question is have I looked at recent papers like Algorand and Snow White and how much has that gone into this stuff? And the answer is uh you know, I've I've, I've looked at them like you know, in a cursory way, enough to tell that they are like not solving the same problem that I'm solving. And, you know, I've talked to the authors and like they are like very kind of clear that like they, you know, aren't solving a mechanism design problem. They don't really care uh, if we have like an equilibrium to follow the protocol f when all the nodes are rational. They only really care about it in the context of a majority of the nodes being honest. It's kind of this, there's this bifurcation in the cryptocurrency space between people who believe that designing blockchains is a, is a Byzantine fault tolerance problem and people who believe that designing blockchains is a mechanism design problem. Um, these people really believe that like reasoning about incentives is not core to the problem, right? Their proofs are not really about incentives. Sometimes, you know, you might get like this, you know, a Nash equilibrium in the context of like, you know, um, majority honest, but none of these, papers, and there's like also Ouroboros, there's a few of them who are kind of claiming to be like, you know, provably correct proof of stake protocols. Like none of them use security deposits. Um, all of them have a majority correct assumption. Um, none of them really uh, are, are, are looking at this as a mechanism design problem. They're all looking at it as a consensus and distributed systems problem. Uh, and, and this kind of really like, this, this, is, this bifurcation is like something that, you know, where, where, where we kind of like split off from like this crowd like years ago. Um, and so our, our work doesn't look a lot like theirs. Sometimes, sometimes it looks a little bit similar in the sense of like, you know, we're gonna have neat protocols for selecting who should make a block next. Um, but, um, and we might care about the fault tolerance of that. But like the primary, primarily des primary design kind of questions for us are like, you know, okay, is following the protocol in equilibrium, you know, under independent choice? Is it in equilibrium under coordinated choice? 
like how much like does this withstand against like some bribing adversary that uh, kind of tries to pay people to deviate from the protocol? And these pro these kind of you know 100% rational models uh, don't sit well with people who are kind of like you know super well versed in consensus literature because they kind of are used to do using Byzantine fault tolerance analysis, which is really quite different. Um, so you know, I, I think there's a big gap between like our work and their work, and there's like a there's like a real reason why like, you know, I'm not asking these people for help. I like that response. I also just <laughs> um, I also wanted to just add, um, I feel like there's a different kind of sentiment when you're building a protocol that is going to be deployed to a network which has which is securing billions and billions of dollars in value and like writing a protocol which theoretically could secure billions and billions of dollars of value because it's like you worry about certain things a lot more and so it's it's terrifying to think oh you know someone could just come in buy up a little bit of the coins and totally wreck the protocol right you know or come in and you know run up a couple miners and totally wreck the protocol like these are considerations that are like Forefront in Vlad and Vitalik's minds, and now you know mine as well, right? So, go ahead, yeah. Sorry, the uh, can you repeat that and catch? Oh yeah. So the question is: Does proof of stake have like you know, is used broadcasting or like peer-to-peer -peer communication? And and you know, at the moment we're just using broadcasting. Uh, but definitely, uh, we're going to need to move to something more like, uh, you know, kind of a kind of like targeted multicast for sharding. Um, but uh, but you know, that is absolutely interesting. And uh, you know, most of the time we kind of we kind of like think of ourselves above the gossip layer, um, but don't really assume too much about the gossip layer. But but uh, but uh, but definitely, it's something that's interesting to me, especially especially in the context of sharding. Um, in, in, in a single blockchain, everyone needs to see everything anyways, and so just the broadcast model is kind of, kind of cool. Um, what do you mean by Casper? Uh, sorry, the question is how far do, do we think Casper is going to be delayed? And, so, and basically, like, you know, there's a bunch of different protocols that we're working on, and if you're talking about, like, you know, the one that is going to be released the soonest, I don't know. Not very. Not 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 as much as people think. Maybe. So I answered this very delicately in a recent talk, uh, relatively recent. I don't think it it doesn't make sense to put timelines on anything. But we're you know making great progress and like, you know, the spec is really you know very close to. I mean, it's. Oh, I'm not even going to repeat. It's just this is such a touchy subject, especially for these kinds of things. It's soon, but. How soon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the question is like, do do I know what the EOS people are trying to do? And basically, they have this thing called delegated proof of stake. Um, you know, ByteMaster has been on it for a while, and it basically is this uh, proof of stake protocol where the coins vote. On who the delegates are, who like run the consensus protocol, and it's basically like a small number of delegates, and the and the security model is basically that like, oh, if delegates are bad, they'll be voted out, and you know, um, it, it basically is. Uh, there's a couple of things that I like that like give me like serious problems with with this protocol. And one of them is like the fact that if I if I if I like in any of my models, it doesn't have any robustness because I can bribe all of the voters. Because it's not—it's not—it's not, it's not like coercion-resistant voting. It's like voting where you see everyone's votes, and so like you, you can really just pay people for votes. Um, another thing is like okay, you know, there's basically a beauty contest to figure out who's going to be the, um, the 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 delegate, and you could easily probably participate in multiple slots in the beauty contest. But really, the main the main thing is that somehow the 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 the, 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 the system is in the hands of coin holders who basically. Have nothing at stake from the point of view of like security deposits being lost. All they have is like momentary ownership of coins, as far as like the protocol is concerned. And somehow, like you know, I don't trust people, you know, kind of generally as like a cypherpunk thing. But also, more more specifically, like coin holders. There's like a there's kind of this like 
power law distributed just, just distribution. There's like you know probably like 20 dudes at most who control like 89 percent of the coins, and they they basically like you know I I I don't I don't know that I want them to be appointing the delegates. Um, I I I prefer systems that are kind of um, much more uh, pessimistic about like the interests of coin holders. Uh, Rick. Hey Rick, I, I need to repeat everything you say on this mic. No. All right, all right. Is this like for the internet or something? Okay, cool. So to answer your question, even though you're over there and I was closer before, um, Jay Kwan made a really good analysis, uh, basically demonstrating that DPoS wasn't uh, Byzantine fault tolerant. Um, so for me, it's one of those things where a lot of times we'll, we do analysis or we're looking at a protocol and at some point you're like, wait a second, this isn't Byzantine fault tolerant. And you're like, well, but it hasn't been hacked yet, right? So, you know, if, they, if they've made their millions of dollars or whatever and they don't get hacked, then, you know, they didn't really need the Byzantine fault tolerance in the first place. So, so I mean, Vlad gave a much more, uh, a less colorful. So yeah, thanks Rick, that was great. Um, so basically, DPoS apparently has, also has problems on the consensus layer rather than just on the kind of incentivization layer, right? So like, the, like the fact that the protocol isn't, you know, Byzantine fault tolerant, you know, independent of the process for choosing the delegates, is like you know a potential other issue. Uh, and it's probably almost surely like it means because it's making a blockchain, it's not safe in asynchrony. Uh, we've known for a long time, like kind of as like collectively as society or like you know narrowly people in this narrow field of distributed computing. Uh, how to make asynchronously safe consensus protocols, which basically will, where, where like after you make a decision, like you know, no matter what the time does, uh, it's it's kind of still cool. Uh, and and most blockchain consensus protocols actually don't have asynchronous safety, and that's one I think one of the big issues uh, from the point of view of like you know uh, gaps between like optimality and current practice that we see. Um, yeah, more more questions. Oh. Sure. So uh, um, the bribing attacker model, Carl wants me to go over it real quick, is uh, a model where basically like there's an, there's an adversary that uh, what they would they directly affect the pay players payouts by 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 promising in a credible way to pay them if certain things happen um, from their budget, um, and, and and these promises to pay can sometimes lead to really efficient attacks where, you know. Um, so, for example, in proof of work, you promise to pay them if the if the proof of work attack fails, and then like if a majority of them go with it because they'll be paid either way, then the proof of work attack succeeds and the attacker doesn't have to end up paying anything. Um, so the bribing attacker model is super interesting and useful um, because uh, it, 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 it's one of the it's like one of the simplest like most tractable models for thinking about economic security. Um, so like, certainly the the first one that I really you know had a had a lot of fun with. Just a kind of uh, note on the, like, the great thing about blockchains is they make it easier for humans to coordinate. And so basically like the bribing attacker model is just like, it also makes it easier for bad guys to coordinate. And you know, creating a uh, system where you can deploy arbitrary code on the network opens up these security vulnerabilities that maybe weren't there before just because it was too hard to coordinate before you had these smart contracts. Um. So, so the story there may be that, like, you know, with a smart contract, you could credibly commit to paying in these cases. Uh, you, you, you can maybe notify everyone that they're being bribed. Uh, someone just needs to build a bribe notification dApp. I'm sure it'll catch on. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the question is, I talked about like you know having maybe paying less for security because of being able to um, recover from failure, and then and, and you know I kind of said like you know if we know how to recover, then we we could maybe have a cheaper time, but the community, you know, who's, who, who's we that know how to cover? Is it like me? Is it the community? I guess when I say that, I mean that like, 
you know, I believe that we can enumerate all the failure modes and understand what it is that the community must do in order to recover. And now, like, whether or not the community, like, will read the user manual, um, or, or, and, or whether the like reality will come into this weird edge case where you, where you know the only option is contentious uh, contentious decision, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of yet to be seen. I mean, this is this is like a, the so I think it's part of the area of like you know uh, this kind of like weird co collective best practices for use kind of guide that I think is like you know. Uh, I think I think I think increasingly over time we're going to see is like super important, right? Because I think people really use blockchains uh, as a community, um, and, and I think I think that it's uh, it, you know we're gonna we're gonna kind of see 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 that see that more and more. Or basically, blockchains start up just because they serve a particular community. Um, Yeah, great. So basically, the question is, okay, like you know, you saw me on Twitter hate on uh, Tezos's coin governance model, and then the question is like, what is better than coins? Well, I mean, basically, it, I, I honestly think that like you know, public discourse and like you know, kind of um, you know, like like the, I, 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 for now, I think like the best bet is this kind of like ad hoc public discourse kind of negotiation. Um, I, th I I believe in like kind of you know like negotiations without a consensus on a measure on how to weigh everyone's votes. Um, because like if we agree on how much everyone's votes count and only coin holders count, basically, I mean, we're gonna be stuck with the power law distribution and we're gonna be stuck with people whose incentives don't necessarily align with the other stakeholders in the community. Stakeholders which we can't actually measure. So for example, like clients are really, really difficult to measure. The only real measure that we have on clients is transaction fees. Uh, other measures are very relatively very easy to civil attack and to, to spoof. Um, there's there's kind of developers, you know, and it's really hard to kind of get a measure on them unless they have like a public reputation or you kind of are personally familiar with them. Um, there's the, 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 there's you know miners and coin holders are all the only people who have like the kind of privilege of being measurable, uh, in, in a way, right? Uh, and 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 so you know I don't think that we should you know give these people control of the protocol because like I don't think their incentives are aligned with user interests, and like I hope that we'll all be users one day, um, you know. Uh, and so, so somehow, like, uh, from the point, but from the point of view of like, m like m mechanism design, um, if you do have a voting system, then like, well, there's just like pretty clear trade-off between like safety and liveness. Where like, the more, the more, like, you make the system safer, and you know, by requiring unanimity, or maybe even unanimity many times in a row and like multiple rounds, like that's like super safe. But like, I'll almost never return a decision, and that would I think would be quite representative of everyone's interests. But if you say do like a majority vote, then like you know there is really no guarantee that a minority's interest will be represented because there's no way to kind of well there's no way to get that proof out of the protocol, right? Um, and so and so a lot of the so, so it's really tough actually to design voting systems that are uh, you know that have that have really strong guarantees. And so what end up pe people end up doing is they make a voting system and then they coordinate extra protocol to convince all their friends to vote the right way, and then like hopefully hopefully that works out. Uh, it doesn't always. Yeah, so, so like, and there's this kind of feeling where it's nice to have votes in an Excel spreadsheet, and it's like, oh, we know that the community chose to do this because there's a majority of votes, right? And that, that, that kind of feels like a nice thing, but if you think about it, it's actually not a good thing because the people who are going to think about gaming that system are going to be the people who want their interests to overshadow all the other users' interests. And so making a system that's harder to game by making it this kind of like social consensus, at least while we don't have a great governance system and we haven't like spent years and years iterating on chain on governance systems, it makes more sense to have this like off chain like you guys figure it out. Like, how are you going to game that? Okay, maybe you you know get a bunch of Reddit bots and you kind of convince people to that you know one chain is bad and another one is good. But like, it makes it a lot less straightforward of a you know attack. Another kind of gen general kind of related comment is that these these in protocol upgrade mechanisms remove a lot of the consent that's involved with hard forks. When you install a hard fork, you know you kind of like really 
get a choice about like whether or not you go like with the community or not, right? If if the, if the community is doing something you disagree with, or part of the community is doing something you disagree with, you don't have to you don't have to go there. Whereas like with an in protocol uh, upgrade mechanism, you could be none the wiser. I mean, you could have a software upgrade happen in the background. Like you don't, you didn't even, you weren't even, you weren't involved in the in the in, in the in the discussion. You didn't even have to install any software. Like your consent was not required, right? Like the only requ consent that's required in like a soft fork, for example, is with miners, right? The only consent that's required in Tezos is coin holders. The only Definity also has the same thing, where like they have this like blockchain neural network, where or, or sorry, nervous system. Which, which, which uses somehow coin voting plus fancy mechanisms to lead to automatic upgrades. Like that, that, that you know, maybe is an efficient way to like upgrade a protocol, but it, it, I don't think it, you know, um, it, 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 it kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't, like, it, like clients are not king in that model, right? Like it's not that like, you know, a client will pay fees only to the people who run the same protocol and therefore the client sets the protocol and, 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 the, and the client determines what the block validity rules, the client determines like, you know, uh, the, the, basically everything that like can affect their state like that is something that you lose when you say let's have in protocol uh, in protocol uh, up upgrades yeah uh, quick quick question not not uh, not for monologues you have to come up here I actually really like Tezos and Definity, but they're really not comparable to Casper or Proof of Work in terms of their ability to service the public, right? I think they're good protocols for different use cases, and I think it's sort of an open question of like exactly what those use cases are. And I think it's sort of a mistake, even though they're marketed as like public blockchains. I think it's basically a mistake to think of them that way for pretty much the reasons you mentioned. It doesn't it doesn't really work. I think for us, from an investor point of view, for me, to put money in it, it's actually to fit worst, worst possible case of oligopoly. Because the oligopoly, that's what it's about. And we, we don't experience with that yet. And hopefully we will not, because hopefully this project will fail. <laughs> but, uh, but all the Tezos EOS, uh, it's more or less the same. You have very small group of people which knows exactly what they're doing, and they have a bunch of naive romantics that got excited about it and start to, you know, start to code, and uh, the guys who are running this, they, they understand they, everything. So that's, that's why. Sure. I mean, I just don't think it's fair to compare something like, def like Tezos and Definity to Casper. Once a consensus proto mechanism and the other is a protocol platform and I, I to me what I realized like I was pretty skeptical about Tezos as well until like last day or two it clicked to me that like nothing none of their consensus protocol their governance mechanisms none of it matters all that they're building is a protocol platform and the consensus mechanism is designed to be upgraded when Casper is finished Tezos can switch to Casper if we come up with a better governance model Tezos can switch to better governance I'm, I think I'm going to anticipate what Vlad's going to say, but 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 the issue with that statement is that it's still controlled by a small group of people, right? Even that voting process is is not really even pretending to be democratic, right? It's it's not. They're they're very open if you just ask the right questions. That it's a, that it's a it's two people running it. I mean, they just say it. Yeah, yeah. They're they're public people. If you just ask them, are you the two people running it? They say yes, we are. Thanks for asking. So. Um, it, it's, uh, yes, it is a platform, and I think it is an interesting platform for s to solving, asking these kind of questions. Right. So, so no, no more questions about altcoins. <laughs> uh, mm, you're, you're, you're right. It isn't, it isn't a consensus protocol. We shouldn't be talking about it. Uh, yeah, what's up? So, so the question is, like, you know, how do we handle the phase out of the miners? Um, you know, I mean, I don't spend too long thinking about this because, um, 
Um, you know, I, 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 I think I think of the miners as like no longer being necessary after after the end of the process. But like you know, I think that miners like will probably you know we will where we are going to do a tiered rollout, and there's going to be a phase where they can mine just like with like less kind of returns, but still on the way to proof of stake. And I think like at that point, like it'll be it'll be pretty clear to them what their kind of like revenue projections and stuff look like, and they'll move to mining other coins. A lot of these miners are already set up to mine multiple coins, anyways. And it's not like there's, um, it's not, there, 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 there aren't a lack of GPU mineable coins. Uh, but, but to be honest, um, you know, I really hope that miners will go and use their, pro, their, their GPUs to provide services on, uh, for various dApps. Um, but you know, I'm not sure that that technology is really going to be there in time for the move, move proof stick. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally a no fan of minor interest, and I don't keep that too secret, basically because I, I, I think miners are like, you know, probably the biggest threat to the protocol um, and, and, and to the like, governance process also. Um, basically because they're being paid like nine, nine, eight, seven, whatever million dollars a day, and they have a really strong vested interest. And basically they have uh, this, this kind of really uh, badly aligned incentives, even within each other, uh, not that they don't necessarily know it. Um, so anyways, another question? Or maybe, uh, yeah, hi, in the back. Yeah, you, yeah. How do I see permission forks like Quorum affecting the Ethereum ecosystem? I mean, um, that's a good question. I'm not really the guy to ask about that. I'm not sure if they're gonna run Casper, maybe they will. Uh, to be honest, that's like outside of my interest area. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So do you mean, can you, so you're asking about the proof stake proof work hybrid huddle model, but I'm not sure which model you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So altcoins with hybrid proof stake proof work models have been, have been around for a little while. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not generally a huge fan of hybrid models because the authentication mechanism of proof of stake is very different from proof of work. Because in proof of work, you kind of have to count the work in the whole blockchain, whereas in proof of stake, you have to have recent coins or you have the long range attack problem. And so the authentication models kind of clash. However, uh, we are going to do this like tiered rollout where we're just gonna add a finality gadget to proof of work and then and, and like change the, and not use proof of work authentication, but use proof of stake authentication. Uh, but the, and then and then basically just a matter of moving pr from proof of work to a proof of stake block proposal mechanism, where basi and basically it's just a, it, which is and the proof of stake block proposal mechanisms are more complicated than proof of work ones, because proof of work ones just kind of dial the spam protection until there's like only one every so long. Yeah, in the back there. Sure. So I mentioned asynchronous safety for consensus protocols, and I, I was wondering if I could elaborate what, what that means. Basically, it means that uh, the safety uh, property doesn't get violated no matter what, no matter how uh, messages get ordered. So imagine if every time a, a node sent a, a message on the network, instead of it going to the destination, they all went to a centralized party that then decided like which ones to dole out to who when. And like that's kind of our setting. Well, basically, and the centralized party can pick any order, right? And so like, and, and so somehow um, any pro order of protocol message arrival is going to be possible and not lead to safety violations. Um, and so basically, it's kind of like a asynchronous consensus thing. Yeah, hello? Hmm. Yeah. Well, so the question, the question is, is the motivation for being live just economic? Well. That's interesting. I mean, because motivation is kind of like a kind of behavioral kind of question, but definitely we have like a non-economic liveness proof that like we you know works in like fault tolerance context, and so like you know, but also we have incentives to not commit liveness faults, and so like we you know we have both the incentives and also the liveness proof for kind of um, a partially synchronous network with like a relatively simple strategy with increasing timeouts. Um, yeah, hello. So the question is, is there a conflict between asynchrony and determinism? 
And I mean, like, yes, to some extent, but, but, uh, but, but the thing to notice is that the protocol specification, you know, uh, is kind of separate from the level of synchrony. And so somehow, we, even though we might get more to undeterminism, it won't be, it won't be like more undeterminism in the protocol. It'll just be in the outcomes of the protocol as taken by the asynchronous network. And so like, you know, like we will have like, you know, it doesn't affect the, the determinism of the protocol even though it affects the protocol outcomes. Kind of this slightly weird thing. Yeah, so block times would be a concrete example. Ruben. Ooh, the long, top three challenges for the long-term Casper. Well, I mean, so which Casper are you asking about? Yeah, 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 that's great. So the ultimate one, yeah. So, so I'm just gonna kind of go with m like my kind of like personal kind of ultimate one. I mean, um, basically like the, the things that are, the thing that's super exciting to me is the idea that we can make a consensus protocol without a, any kind of fault tolerance threshold in the protocol. Where basically uh, clients make fault tolerance decisions client side. They say, look, I wanna make decisions only when I can tolerate 50% of faults, 60%, 33%. And kind of, you know, we know how to do this for the most part basically pull the threshold out of the protocol and make it client side. And it's super cool because it kind of gets rid of uh, points for cartelization around the threshold points in the protocol. And it has like this really, and it, and it also kind of moves, um, it moves the decisions to the edges of the network rather than to the core of the protocol. And, 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 and therefore it's like somehow much harder to game because there might be some you know, asymmetry of information. Like, you don't know what safety threshold your victim is using. That's one thing. Uh, another thing that I really want is like, you know, um, proofs. I want really nice proofs of like the correctness of the payouts, right? I want to be able to say like, hey, look, somehow there's like this relatively small bound of parameters that like, that maximizes robustness like under like these models or somehow, you know, like so, 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 so the, 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 the actual um, like optimal parameters proof as opposed to something where we kind of like show that it's not too bad, you know? Um, and, and, and another thing, that, something that I'm super excited about and something that I've kind of, um, well, two other things. One, one, one thing I'm super excited about and that I've kind of done some work on recently is I've been, I've been able to replicate um, uh, rewrite semantics that has concurrent execution. And so we can have a situation where we can have like blocks that don't need to be ordered, blocks that do need to be ordered and kind of a minimum amount of consensus on any given uh, like computational theory. Which is like, yeah, I mean, so I'm super excited about that because like it's gonna be like, a, I will, you know, maybe, maybe. Uh, it's kind of, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. I'd rather do it at the end of like an hour talk. But, uh, uh, but, but basically, um, somehow, you know, uh, we, we were used to replicating like a bit in like consensus protocol literature. We're used to replicating like a, a virtual machine that you like, you know, do transactions with in blockchain but like every transaction happens sequentially you could imagine that say like uh, you know a block that affects only contracts over here and a block that affects contracts over there don't need to be stacked on each other uh, they can kind of kind of happen concurrently and we don't need to agree on their order because it doesn't matter if we execute one first and then the other or vice versa and we still get the same outcome and so like somehow um, there is there is the your, your ability to make these decisions describes the like, concurrency that is possible in a particular execution environment. Um, and so like, I can kind of like, take an arbitrary concurrent execution environment like, expressed as a set of rewrite rules uh, and, and like, make a structure where like, we kind of agree only on the minimum amount of contentious stuff and like, don't otherwise. And I'm like, you know, super excited about it, so I'm sharing it, but I don't expect you to understand it, so I feel bad. Uh, uh, also, the uh, last thing I'm super excited about um, is like, you know, I mean, like, like sharding stuff. I think I, ha I had something else. I don't remember. Sorry. So the big, I, I mean, I, I would say that Vlad definitely covered all of the real, like, exciting things, but I would say that, like, subjective finality plus the concurrent, you know, arbitrary rewrite rules is really nice because then you can see like, oh, my arbitrary, you know, this is safe and maybe that's not safe or, you know, you get this ability to like come to finality way faster because of it. And so that's like a really cool thing. But I'm just, just for fun, I'm going to give you why subjective finality is difficult 
when you're doing rotating validators. And so the reason why this is kind of difficult, this is why it's kind of like a, one, a challenge of a future protocol, is because the way that the rotating validators work, if you remember, it was like, oh, the consensus knows that the handshake went off, right? The, the consensus knows, oh, this, this ep, uh, epoch got finalized, the next epoch got finalized, we can change the validator set. So it's like a really clear, because everyone's using the same threshold for finality. But if you start allowing arbitrary finalization, then one validator can say, this validator set is what I see because my finality threshold is, you know, 99%, but then another one uh, sees, oh, this is a, a totally different validator set is the validators that I see because my finality threshold is, you know, 30% for some reason. One of, the, one of the solutions to that problem, uh, and both of those, uh, VLADs 1 and 3, are both uh, very important to scaling, right? And they, and they correlate to how existing enterprises actually scale their infrastructure. Um, and I'm not going to explain how. Uh, but, um, but basically what you're talking about, we can get the, the epoch finality, and that can be effectively not tunable. Right, so that's sort of like your, your, your shard zero. That's where all of the shards actually have to finalize to. And then, and then your other shards have this sort of. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you totally, you don't, need, you don't need to have a, you don't need to have actually consensus on the handshake. What you can do is have everyone have their own personal handshake, fake track, and everyone that they are looking at, actually they know is held to account. And they all have deposits in the Casper contract, but the Casper, Casper contract doesn't really know who is validly in this deposit set as with respect to any particular clients, because they might e each make like different thresholds. And so, like, it is tricky, but uh, it is the dream. And this is open research, as you can see. Um, didn't mention sharding yet. I. Yeah, so, so sharding uh, basically corresponds to taking the overhead uh, that extensive protocol has or like the blockchain has and giving different pieces of it to different nodes rather than having everyone do everything. And so you can like shard validation by not having everyone validate everything, shard storage by not having everyone store everything, shard consensus by not having everyone come to consensus on everything. And kind of eventually like if you shard consensus then you end up having like a bunch of kind of effectively concurrently executing consensus protocols that somehow have some consensus between them. Uh, and you get this like, neat nesting kind of structure, um, but there's, there's, the, the space of sharding protocols is quite large, uh, and so when someone says sharding, it's not actually, uh, it's, it's usually not always understood immediately what exactly protocol they're talking about, but they're not talking about state channels, right? They're not talking about off-chain transactions. They're talking about like making the chain somehow bigger by allowing different pieces of it to be executed concurrently by different sets of nodes. So, so Raiden is a state channel. So it basically does like off-chain transactions, uh, which is a scaling solution because it like lets you do netting without settlement, which means that you do fewer transactions. Uh, but it's not it's not sharding. Anyways, uh, yeah. Hi. Oh, uh, can we talk about inflation post proof work? Yeah. So this gets down to some of the discussion I was having earlier about um, you know how much security is enough security. We're basically like you know. Um, and, and, but, the, but, the, but the main thing I want to push back against is like the notion that, that like inflation is the correct term, um, because like to me and like you know, uh, like we're not engineering a monetary system, like this we're not doing monetary theory, we're not doing monetary economics, like this it, like we're building a platform, like ether is is like you know not like the next U.S. dollar, like don't let anyone tell you that it is. Um, so you know, and and, and 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 neither is Bitcoin, but you know they might not admit it. Uh, uh, but, uh, but somehow, you know, uh, the the question of issuance is just a question about like what's good for users, what's good for the security of the protocol. Like these are the types of you know these are the, these are the questions. We're not really trying to do monetary policy, but the thing that we do need to make sure is that the token has a price. And so if you would do too much issuance, the price could potentially go to zero and that would undermine the protocol guarantees. And so like Vitalik had this nice heuristic that like somehow issuance should be like less than global GDP growth, which I thought was like, you know, yeah, not, not too unreasonable in the sense that like maybe if that's true, the price won't go to zero, 
but you don't really know. But but definitely, like you can avoid hyperinflation by not having the rate of issuance be too too high. But basically, um, you know, it, I think it's misleading to think of it as monetary policy as much as just kind of uh, mechanism design and like you know uh, su su supply models for for tokens or something. Yeah. No, this, this isn't actually probabilistic at all. Uh, you might be able to understand it probabilistically if you say add a probability model to like the way the network messages propagate. But like, you know, uh, as uh, like asynchronously safe, like subjective finality can be done with a completely deterministic protocol. Um, it's like the liveness where people end up having to like add some, 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 uh, some, some non-determinism in like traditional kind of consistent protocol research. Hey, Ruben. Yeah. Oh, what would the wish for help? Oh, I guess like you know, um, there's a, there's a, there's a few things, but uh, mostly I guess like the the helping with the problems is like my favorite. You know, I need we need help with like you know certain problems like certain engineering. Like if you're really good at like you know mechanism design or like um, you know uh, computer science distributed systems. Like even even if you even if, even if you really want to optimize some code, uh, that might also be helpful. Um, but uh, outside of that, like you know, say you know a lot, like maybe you can do some like education. Maybe you can help help curate like knowledge bases. Um, there's it basically it's mostly about um, kind of contributing through either like adding to the knowledge base or sharing the knowledge base. Uh, that's like the main the main kind of thing. You know, maybe um, maybe one day, uh, you know. Uh, Call you to donate to the Ethereum Foundation, but you know. Yeah. So, just to just to like add on to that, one good thing is that all of our incentives, to some degree, are a little bit aligned, right? Like in the community, you know, as long as you're furthering like crypto economic research and you're thinking about my here's my plea, and this is kind of just a general thing, is if you're thinking about these like problems, right? And you're thinking about, okay, I can design this economic system, and my economic system will have this property, this property, and this property. Then I would, I would love if you have a justification, your best justification. It doesn't have to be a good justification. In fact, it will be a bad justification for many, many years. But like, if, you're, if, if you lie, lie, lay out your parameters and your properties, and you justify them with like your best shot, then that does so much for furthering everyone else's research, right? Because if you come up with this cool model where you can say like, oh, I, I made this economic choice because these actors are going to counterbalance this and I'm able to plot all of the different outcomes and you know, show where it's right. Like that does a lot for everyone else because now people can use your model. So like, let's use the scientific method and share on the internet, open source, give everything away and you know, live in harmony. Yeah. And live in harmony, even even if your transaction doesn't get in for 20 hours, you know. Even if like you know that we have like scalability problems, um, you know, we you need to like kind of chill out. Like you know, freaking out isn't actually helping. Um, you know, we're doing our best to work on these problems. And actually, like scalability has moved up the priority list. Uh, and so like you know, we we, we'll, we should try to pump out some stuff. But um, anyways, let's do like one more question and then maybe we'll do a little bit of whiteboarding, maybe? Yeah, yeah, P186 is like this, this EAP. It's not the best, well, the most well-written EAP, but it, it, it suggests that we lower the block rewards. And like I'm super into lowering the block rewards as a concept. I mean, this is something I've kind of been like agitated for a few months ago, but like before the price of ether went up so high. Um, and 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 basically, like to me, like I kind of mentioned earlier, like I kind of think that like um, if you pay people too much for security, it'll turn into like a security racket. And there's like a certain amount of marginal diminishing marginal returns. Like every additional dollar that you pay gets you actually like less than like the last dollar of security. Um, and so and so somehow. Like, you know, if, if, like, I was negotiating for the entire community with miners and they were trying to tell me, like, oh, you got to pay, like, $7 million a day, like, I would, you know, not make my, like, counteroffer okay, 
you know, like, yes, let's do it, right? I, I, th I would kind of, like, you know, probably want to scale that back a little bit, especially if, like, just a few months ago, I was only paying them, like, $500,000 a day, you know? There's, like, you, could, you, could, you can kind of see that, like, like I, I definitely, like, the price isn't right to me. Like, I'm pretty, it's pretty clear. But, like, what is the right price is, like, also, like, somewhat unclear because, like, to some extent, you know, it does, like, having more hash rate buys us time against an adversary. Um, and so, like, it's more security. But it's also, like, you know, it's not clear that um, it's a more mining rewards is always better for anyone except for miners. Um, great. Uh, so I feel like we've done a lot of questions. Um, 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 let me take a look at the time and see if we want to talk more tech. Is it 4.30? I mean, I, um, what do you guys want? Questions or tech? Air conditioning. We want air conditioning. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'd be happy with a I'd be happy with a 10, 15 minute break. Okay, cool. Cheers, thanks everyone. Yeah. One of mine is coming through. Thanks for settling down. Um, so now we're going to go through and do some, we're going to get into like the more nitty gritty of consensus protocol stuff. Uh, we're going to have Carl give you a rundown of the friendly finality gadget. And then I'll give you a rundown of the kind of correct by construction consensus protocol approach and, uh, you know, progress so far. So here we go, Carl. Casper, the friendly finality gadget. All right, so, so normally you do like the presentation and then Q&A, but we're like killing it. And now you get to know what the protocol is like. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay, there, there are two terms that are really important. This is Casper the Friendly Finality Gadget, right? So this is the first kind of Casper uh, that is going to be, you know, first thing on the roadmap, essentially. Um, and this is something that Vitalik has spec'd out, um, the two blog posts. Uh, you know, safety under, actually, I, I don't remember the names right now, but you can look, it on, look, at, look at it on his Medium account. Um, so, first important term, um, epoch. Okay, so an epoch, you can just think of it as the passing of 100 blocks. So the way that it'll work, start out, is we're going to do hybrid proof of stake and proof of work. By the way, I actually also gave a talk recently, which kind of like goes over this a little bit, and I'm just going to do like the lightning version so Vlad can you know, give his thing. Um, so essentially, what we have is every 100 blocks, we're going to keep proof of work. So we're going to do mining will not change, right? All we're going to do is we're going to layer on top of the mining a finality gadget. That's why it's called you know, Casper the Friendly Finality Gadget. We're going to give the blockchain economic finality, which means that at any one of these checkpoints, so each uh, thing that we give finality, each block that we give finality is going to be called a checkpoint, right? So that's like, you know, think about it, you're like, okay, I'm saving my progress on the blockchain. Um, now, what this, we're going to be trying to save our progress, trying to checkpoint the blockchain once every epic, epoch. And each epoch is going to be, you know, around, this can change, like around 100 blocks, you know, whatever. Now, what that means is, right, we have our normal blockchain, and let's say I drew 100 of these dots, right, this would be, you know, this would be epoch 1, this would be e epoch 2, right? Of course, there's going to be a lot more, you know, blocks in between, 100, or 99. Now, 98. Um, so, the, what we're going to do is we're going to run the consensus protocol on these two blocks, right? And the consensus protocol is defined, is really, it, what it does, right, we're trying to provide finality. So, like, it's, it's really important to, like, we can go over again, you know, what is economic finality? Economic finality means that if the history changes, that people lose a bunch of money, right? So, we're, this is our only goal. We're just trying to provide economic finality. So, what that means is we want to say that, you know, this is maybe a third epoch. We're going to say that 
if, if this block, right, this block were to change, and it was finalized by this, you know, magical consensus protocol, which I'm going to kind of talk about, if this was finalized, but then someone created a blockchain and convinced everyone, you know, finalized this as well, finalized it according to the protocol, right? So now there's like two finalized blockchains. Well, then what was going to happen is we're going to punish someone. So this is, gets back to the attributable faults. This is why we did Q&A first, right? We got to have these terms. But um, so this gets back to the attributable, attributable faults because we're going to, based on the protocol, know this, you know, this set of validators equivocated or, you know, someone, you know, some, some set and the actual set is at least two-thirds for, uh, for the uh, final finality guarantee to be broken, then at least one-third of all validators must have equivocated slash broken a slashing condition. And a slashing condition means that a condition at which point you lose all of your funds. That's what like slashing means. It's like, oh, we know you did something bad and we're going to take away your money. Now, before you ask, you can't actually, if you are an honest validator, like I can make sure when, with 100% certainty that I do not break these slashing conditions. So it's like I am always able to make sh to to like look at all of the messages I sent and like send it to you know different people as long as um, you know you are able to get your messages included into the blockchain. But anyway, so this is kind of the general structure, right? We're just providing finality on every 100 blocks, and the actual slashing conditions. I I feel like it's better to go over those slashing conditions in a. Uh, uh, in the, the kind of blog posts or in the video that, that was just posted because they really go, you know, do each one of a service. But maybe questions on like the general construction of this thing. Uh, yes, so that's a very good question. Um, essentially, the question was, uh, what is the difference between, you know, maybe a Casper with economic finality and proof of work, right? So first off, proof of work does not have finality, like, at all. It doesn't have any economic finality or finality period. That's because there's always the opportunity to create a longer chain than what is perceived currently as a canonical chain, and then that longer chain is going to be chosen over the shorter chain. Now, in Casper, that is not going to be possible because we have this guarantee. And we say that if this reaches our economic finality, which proof of work, you know, proof of work doesn't even concern itself with economic finality and has no gadgets to get this economic finality, if we reach this point where there is this kind of structure, where we do have two blockchains, one that wants to kind of like you know, be a longer chain. Let's say this one, you know, grew, you know, really long or something. And we have, you know, many e epochs further, right? In proof of work, if we were just doing normal proof of work, we'd choose this chain, right? But in proof of stake with Casper and a hybrid model, we are going to choose this chain, assuming that the equivocating nodes were, you know, that this chain is, you know, favored even when all the uh, slashing conditions have been you know, met and you actually total up the balances. So essentially what that means is we, and we have a, a proof where safety can only be, uh, where, where we formally prove, and it's actually not we, it's Yoichi, um, big props to him, he's formally verified that, uh, that there is uh, safety under these four slashing conditions. And so those slashing conditions, once again, are the rules by which all validators have to follow and if they don't follow those rules to a T, then someone can say, oh, I see this validator is not following the rules. Let me tell the chain, let me tell the other validators that they have broke the rules. And then I, th that validator will have their deposits slashed or destroyed. And my deposits, you know, at that point will, you know, have more weight, essentially. So you're able to say, like, for sure, that proof of work does not have economic finality. And because, I mean, it doesn't have finality, period. And uh, 
proof of stake does have this economic finality guarantee. Cool. So. Cool. Um, so recently, there's been a massive refactor to Pi Ethereum. So Pi Ethereum, huh? Oh, restate the question. Thank you. Um, so, so essentially, the question was, what kind of languages do you use um, to uh, write this stuff or do your proof of concepts, et cetera? Um, so the, 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 the implementation, a lot of like the blockchain node is done in Pi Ethereum, which is the Python Ethereum client. But of course, it's going to be done in all of the different blockchain uh, implementations or Ethereum implementations, you know, Gaff Parity, et cetera. Um, and then uh, you will, and then we're doing. Uh, Vitalik is writing the actual Casper contract right now in Viper. Um, you know, of course, it's like Viper is a really cool language, um, and that's you know, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense for you know the the. Um, you know, Vitalik wrote that contract, and he's writing it in Viper, so it's pretty cool. Um, the other thing is that we, uh, the only other kind of bit, maybe language that's worth mentioning is Isabel. Um, so Yoichi's formal uh, proofs that the slashing conditions do in fact work are uh, is written in Isabel, which is a like a language in which you can formally verify um, you know properties of your code. I'm really not sure about the roots of Isabel. Sorry. <laughs> cool. So I guess we're going to go on to Vlad's theoretical. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, so let me just say that Isabel is like a model checker. Um, I don't know how it's like what the back end is built on, but it's like, you know, it's not like Haskell in the sense that um, Haskell is more about like, doing proofs, whereas like somehow model checking is some, some, something a little bit different. I mean, I'm definitely not the guy to ask about that, though. Um, I am the guy to ask about this uh, consensus protocol stuff that I'm about to talk to you about, though. Uh, and, 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 and basically, so what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a kind of high-level overview over, of the like, safety proof that um, all of my kind of correct by construction consensus protocols um, are derived to satisfy. Uh, and then the kind of, there's like, it's relatively simple proof, and, and the thing that I really like about it is it helps me think about the, the bridging the gap between this blockchain world where decisions aren't finalized, but they can be reverted to a world where like decisions are final and they can't. Um, and basically, it, it actually ends up being a relatively simple kind of proof. Um, so um, basically, there's, there's, there's norm, normally when we think about consensus protocols, we think about decisions and this property called consensus safety. Consensus safety means that two nodes who follow the protocol and make a decision make the same decision. If they were to make different decisions, then like the safety condition would be, or the safety definition would be violated. In a blockchain world though, since we don't have a concept of decisions, our notion of safety is actually quite a bit different. Um, we have this thing called estimate safety instead. So estimate safety um, this is the name that I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of go with. Because an estimate is not, unlike a decision, maybe will be revised later. And an esti estimate safety basically says is like, this node will never revise its estimate. It basically says that like, you know, kind of a local question of whether it will ever change its mind into the future. So in Bitcoin, you would ask like, will I ever see a block that has the most difficulty that doesn't include this block? And that's kind of a very local question of safety uh, that it turns out is actually somehow deeply related or, or, or related via this proof that I'm about to show you um, to consensus safety. So basically, um, I'm going write, to write down some of these terms. So basically, so, so we, ha we have consensus safety, which basically mean, uh, means like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of write this in like really like simple English. Two nodes decide the same. This is not a very rigorous definition. Um, and and so, so consensus safety basically says like two nodes decide the same thing. And then estimate safety is basically like one node won't change its mind. So 
it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, somehow they're very different notions, right? This one is entirely local about whether one node state. This one is about like the output values of two nodes, right? Normally when we build consensus protocols, we work hard to satisfy this because normally like we are working in a world where we want to make decisions which are finalized and irreversible. And when I say normally, I mean like kind of pre-blockchain, like before Bitcoin. And now kind of post-Bitcoin, we care also about this notion of like reversible decisions and thinking about like the safety of that. And so somehow, you know, uh, if like, you know, one block confirmation is safe, if like you'll never, you'll never choose a blockchain that doesn't have that block. In practice, it turns out that like actually one block confirmations are unsafe some proportion of the time, like, you know, like 1% or like less of the time. I don't really know the, 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 the orphan rates. Um, um, but six blocks somehow in practice has, has turn, turned out to be like quite safe for most nodes where basically like we've never really had a more than six block reversion due to like a double, double spend, although there was an invalid block. Um, you know, some, so somehow though, we, we, this doesn't give a clear story about how this is related to that. And basically like there is actually like a relatively simple proof that basically says like kind of the following. Um, this is kind of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it down as like a, like a fact, even though I haven't given you the proof. Basically, so decisions on safe estimates have consensus safety. Sorry, I'm trying to write down quickly, so I'm not spending a lot of time doing that. But uh, it, it, so it's maybe not the most legible, but somehow um, there's this really neat result that says like you know um, if if my estimate is safe, then somehow I, if I decide on that estimate, then like we should have consensus safety. And there's a, and there's a really kind of simple simple way to to, to prove this. It basically says it kind of go, goes goes as follows. Imagine Carl and I are on a network, and um, you know, I'm safe, um, or, or uh, th then it can't be the case that Carl can send me something that makes me change my estimate. So if, if, if because like if, he, if that were the case, then I wouldn't be safe because the definition of safety is that like I won't change my estimate. So if I'm safe, then there's nothing Carl could send me that will make me change my estimate. If Carl is safe, there's nothing I could send him to change, make him change my estimate. But uh, as long as the estimator that we have is deterministic, in the sense that like, no matter what me uh, set of messages we receive, in, no, sorry, if we each receive the same set of messages, then we each choose the same estimates. Then it's also going to be the case that if I send all, my, all, if I send some stuff to Carl, like everything I've ever seen, like all the protocol messages I've ever received to Carl, and he sends all the protocol messages he's ever received to me, then we'll have at the end the same stuff, um, and and that means at the end we'll have the same estimate. But it kind of we each. So, so, but if we're each safe at the beginning, then neither of us will, will change our estimate as a result of this operation. And so if we have the same estimate at the end and we never changed the, our estimates, then somehow we have the same estimate at the beginning of this process. And kind of like, that's, that's the outline of the proof. So, so, so again, if we can't convince each other to change our estimates because, because we're safe, then that means that if we pass each other our views, we will have the same estimate which means that we actually have the same estimate now because we have the same estimate after each not changing our estimates. So, you know, it's a relatively simple proof, you know, like kind of heuristically, like, uh, like, like, you know, at this a kind of high level abstract, abstractly. Uh, and, you know, and Yoishi did do like a formal verification of this proof for a particular protocol. Um, um, I even helped a little bit. It was pretty exciting. Um, and, and it, but basically, like, it turns out that this is like a very general shape that can be satisfied by very many different protocols. Where basically, what you need to do is kind of establish, okay, you know, what are the data structures? What, is, what are estimates? What is like the function that says, like, given a set of protocol messages, what is your estimator? And then, like, is is there a, 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 a way of a protocol state in which your estimate is safe? And like, if so, then uh, and you can detect it, then we can make this consensus protocol that, that is kind of correct by construction in the sense that it will only decide on an estimate after detecting that it's safe and therefore uh, inherit the, this kind of property that like decisions on safe estimates have consensus safety. Um, and, and somehow this, 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 this property really t nicely ties in estimate safety and consensus safety 
um, and like ties in what it like what kind of like the notion of consensus that we have in blockchain with the notion of consensus that we normally have. Basically saying that okay, okay, if we were to add um, a decision rule that says like okay, somehow if you wait n blocks before deciding, then like you can kind of show that in a partially synchronous network there is like a big enough n so that like in proof of work um, um, th that's safe uh, in sense of estimate safety, which means that it'll also be safe in terms of consensus safety via this you know relatively simple proof that says that um, if we're both safe then we can't convince each other, which means that we have to have the same estimate because if we can't convince each other then we we have the same estimate af like after the end of the process where we try to convince each other and send each other all our messages. So, you know, it's a little bit compl complex, but the really cool thing about this is that, uh, is, is, is that once you kind of set up this, the, the safety proof, what you can do is you can make a protocol that whose, whose goal is to produce estimate safety. And then what, if, you can, if you can do that and show that there's like at least some one state of the protocol that like has estimate safety, um, then you then then you can kind of have like a correct by construction consensus protocol, and you know it took me a while to kind of put this together for the binary consensus, and then I spent like many months working on the binary consensus, where basically like we're kind of trying to have a consensus on like a bit, and like an estimate is like a bit, and then somehow in the last like six months I've been able to crank out a bunch more consensus protocols that also satisfy the same proof, um, basically by setting up the data structures so that. Um, the the like, so that we can define an estimator, and so that we can define estimate safety, and then and and then therefore inherent proof, and then like kind of we have to show that there is like some non-trivial case where estimate safety exists as at a minimum, but ideally we kind of find a way to detect estimate safety, and so kind of um, what I what I can do is I can show you the data structures involved in some of these various um, protocols that that that, that I've worked on. Kind of give you give you a feel for for what I'm talking about. So um, in the binary consensus, we have you know these with these bets, and the bets have an estimate, uh, which is which is either zero or one. And then they have a sender, which is a validator, VL used to denote the set of all validators, and they have a justification, which is a set of bets. So the power power set of bets. So somehow. You know, this, this isn't maybe the best definition, but it's good enough to get, get across the main, po main point. It basically says that like, like it's just the data structure that we're using for the binary consensus has like an estimate, which is like a zero or a one, a sender, and a justification, which is like a, a set of bets that were like seen, and they basically have to justify that bet. And basically what it ends up being the case is like, unless a majority of validators by weight as seen in the justification are going with one, then it's invalid to put a one here. Unless the majority are going with zero, then it's invalid to put a zero there. So somehow, the bet's validity has to do with whether or not it's justified in the justification. And so then there's, there ends up being two slashing conditions. One of them is when the bet is invalid, i.e., you know, you say one when really the majority in the justification says zero, or you equivocate. So equivocation, we kind of mentioned before, um, it, it is a certain type of Byzantine fault where what you do is you maintain, where you kind of instead of running just like a single thread of the prog of the protocol, you run multiple. And as a result, can, can kind of have one opinion and the other uh, as far as different nodes are concerned, and which, you can, which can lead you to, uh, which can lead these nodes to making separate decisions. And so, if all these protocols have the same two slashing conditions. Uh, one of them is that if the block is invalid, then you get slashed. The other is if you equivocate, then you get slashed, and like that's it, which is another kind of nice thing about, the, about these protocols. Uh, and equivocation basically says two bets from the same validator are an equivocation if neither of them are inside their. There are justifications under closure. So basically, if, if I have two bets, B1 and B2 from a validator, which means from the same validator, which means like the entry here is, is the same, and they're not in each other's justification, then they're an equivocation. They're kind of not, not single threaded. There's like somehow you can't follow the justification from one to find the other. Um, and, and it's kind of maybe that's a little abstract, but I can I can kind of draw it. Um, so the way the way we would normally draw this. Is something like this. So we'd have like maybe for three validators, we would have like v1, maybe v1 which has like weight of three, v2 which weight which has weight of four, v3 which has weight of five, and like maybe maybe v v. I need a different color. Um, maybe 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 v1 had an initial bet of zero, and v2 had an initial bet of zero, and v5 uh, v3 had an initial bet of zero, 
And so like somehow like they should, no matter how they pass bets around, be, be always stuck on zero. But if one of them equivocates, and the reason that's the case is because if they were to make any justification out of these, these bets, the majority would be zero. But, but what this guy can do is make, not, instead of making an invalid bet, he'll make a bet with estimate one that doesn't refer to his old bet with estimate zero. And so, and so somehow this is a valid bet, just like that one is. But now uh, this validator can like validly switch to one, and like this validator can validly switch to one. So somehow the, I'm using these arrows to represent the justifications, these, the uh, alignment in vertically to, to represent which sender it is, and then the actual like the, the number to be the estimate. And so somehow this, this, this behavior here led to a switching of the estimate from zero to one. Um, and it is identifiable as equivocation because like this one doesn't point to that zero and the zero doesn't point to one. If they did, then, it would, then, then this validator would have made an invalid bet because it's illegal to say one uh, just based on seeing zero or if they say zero just based on seeing one. And so th this kind of behavior is, is, is Byzantine uh, and it's called equivocation and that's what we always slash for that. So all these protocols are gonna have this kind of shape. Where basically there's a rule for validity that has to do with like what the majority of the people in justification say according to their most recent bets. And then there's the question about uh, the, the validity of the estimate. So that's kind of cool. Um, uh, and, and, and somehow the, the, na the main question is like, can I detect safety? Well, I kind of actually slipped in a little analysis here that said like, oh, if they all choose zero, then it should always be zero in the future because like they can only choose justifications that are zero. And, so, and that actually corresponds to an analysis that says that we're safe in the context of no equivocations. Because there's no, no way for them to all progress the protocol making only valid messages in a single thread that will change the value from zero to one. Uh, and so, it, you know, that should give you a hint that it is possible sometimes to achieve and recognize safety. Um, the more general algorithm for that is, is, is totally interesting. But let me, let me continue doing, showing some of these different data structures. So this is kind of for the binary. Now, for, 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 for ordinal numbers, I basically have like this, this basically like I'm gonna draw like kind of like large lowercase sigma <laughs> to show to like be all ordinal numbers on, 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 on the set of blocks. Um, and validator and justification, it's like a similar thing. So this protocol agrees on an ordinal number of all the blocks, kind of orders all the blocks. And the way that I did it is basically with the, with the estimator, instead of doing like a majority on zero or one, I, did a, I do a ranked pairs uh, voting protocol where everyone kind of ranks the, the, the orders and then we kind of get this outcome which is another ranking and so somehow the, the, this is only valid if it's a it's if it's a correct rank pairs election on the justification um, yeah hmm. oh yeah so uh, sorry uh, an ordinal number is, so the question is like, oh, remind us what an ordinal number is. An ordinal number basically says like an order. It's, it's an order as opposed to like a count. It says like this one, then that one, then this one, then that one, as opposed to saying like, oh, five. You know, it's more like first, second, third. So, so somehow the ordinal number will give all of an order over like some, some set. And so somehow like the order here has to be the outcome of the estimator run on the justification, which ranks, which does like a ranked pairs thing on the, on the latest, on the, based on the latest messages. So that's, that's, this is kind of for the ordinal number. Uh, so I'll actually draw the estimates here. So like this is for the bit, this is for like ordinal numbers. The more, more interesting one kind of recently is for the blockchain, um, which basically has, uh, basically here we're gonna have a, the prev block, right? So it, which is like kind of somehow the best, the best block that's seen in the view. So like it's also a block and then a validator and then justification and here basically the estimate is a block, which basically, and in, in, in the validator kind of says, look, this block is the best scoring block um, out of all of the forks as seen from the justification. And, and this, this, this requirement for single threadedness means that you can't unsee a block, uh, blockchain after you've, you've made a block that says that you've seen these blockchains and chose this one. You can't in the future unsee them. And this kind of will restrict validators' choices as to which chain to, to mine on. And we can kind of find that like even something simple like this uh, with three validators, like let's assume it's the same one, same weight. Like this validator has seen these, these chains, these guys, and so can't build the block on this guy because it, it, he's already committed to seeing those ones. This validator, um, you know, would equivocate to make a block again on the, say this is like on the genesis. Um, 
this validator, like, you know, so, so basically, like, it turns out, like, that like, this is safe, and it takes, like, kind of an, some equivocation, because all of these guys are kind of committing to see this one. Um, and so, like, if I was to, if, say, this one was to create a new block here, no one can really switch, but if this guy were to equivocate also, then, then we could kind of get another chain to be, to be, to be chosen. Um, yeah, please, please go ahead, Ar. No. No, no. So what was happening here is kind of like the third, the third block was, was finalized in, uh, in, in under, under the assumption of there are no Byzantine faults. And actually, it's actually finalized also under the assumption that there are one Byzantine fault, given that there's only these three validators. But that's kind of a calculation that, I, that you have to do and that I haven't really spelled out to a satisfying extent for you guys. Um, but uh, basically, every block when it's proposed isn't finalized, but every block kind of constrains a validator and what messages they can make in the future, constrains their choices of forks that they can make in the future without being Byzantine, and therefore um, contributes towards getting the protocol into this kind of uh, commit state where, uh, where, where no matter what, the protocol is kind of locked on a certain value. And so every block, even though it's not finalized when it's published, contributes to the process of like finalizing stuff as long as there's kind of like, you know, uh, on the best chain, you know, kind of synchrony assumptions allowing that kind of thing. Yeah, hey, John. So the question is, well, is a valid justification only things that are in blocks? Well, so justification includes includes blocks, which you kind of get from you get from like listening on the gossip network, and really what it what it needs to include is kind of any updates to the latest blocks that you've seen from other validators. Uh, basically because it's the latest blocks that you've seen from other validators that kind of determines where, the, where you see the stake as being, like on this fork or that fork, which is going to determine uh, which, 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 which chain you actually go, go for. And so maybe actually it would be super helpful if I showed the fork choice rule for, valid, for, for, for determining whether this block is valid. Um, and so let's do it. So basically, um, here's kind of here's going to be the story. So we're going to have some number of validators. Let's do four validators, um, and we're going to have like this genesis block, and maybe validator two will make a block. Maybe validator two will make a block first, and then maybe we're going to get another block here, and then like a block here. But maybe there's a fork here, and maybe validator two sees this one again. And somehow maybe the weights are like three, four, five, and six. So these are like all of their weights. Um, and, and then, and then the, the question is kind of like, okay, what's the best, what's the best fork here? What's, is, it, is, it, is it like kind of like, you know, we kind of have some hint that it's like either this one or that one. Um, but, but basically, like, how do we make this choice? And, um, you know, to, 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 make, to make this actually a little more interesting, let's add, let's add, another, let's add another fork here. Um, so basically, you, you kind of start at the genesis block, and then you like you ask like, okay, well, uh, out of out of the the last blocks that we've seen, the last messages we've seen from all the validators, which in this case are like this one, this one, that one, and that one, uh, you know, how much of the weight are are in all of all alternatives? Well, the, all of the weight is here, and so we're kind of happy to make this choice. Here, similarly, we're going to ask, okay, where is most of the weight? And we'll find, oh, actually. Uh, there's like three plus four plus five is on this fork, whereas only like six is on this fork, and so like we go this way, and then here you know there's only one way we can just go up there, and then here we decide okay like you know the, whether we go this way or this way we basically need to ask again like out of the latest messages of the blocks where is there more weight, and there's like more weight over here, and so somehow like this is like the magic best block, and like if this is in your justification. It would be invalid for you to say anything but this block as your estimate. Otherwise, you you kind of like you would have made an invalid block, and you know you kind of like lose your deposit, right? And so you know, but but say like imagine if we were to like erase this block and it, pretend that it never happened, um, then um, then this choice would actually be different because here we have like weights three and four on the left, whereas we have weights five and six on the right, and so we kind of end up choosing this block as the best one. And so. Uh, somehow, depending on whether this block, this validator next sees this one or that one, 
we can kind of deter, like choose this like a fork on here versus a fork on there. Uh, and so and so this kind of can show you also that at the moment we don't have safety over this decision because if this guy makes this valid this this block here which is totally uh, a, a valid block because there's more weight here than he's seen, uh, you know, here. Uh, now, somehow, the, 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 the correct fork choice rule is on this side. And so, like, this choice wasn't safe because it was possible for this guy to make a block that caused our choice to move onto that side of the, uh, onto, that, onto, this, onto this side of the kind of uh, blockchain. And it's, it's a little bit confusing here. I should, I should draw these arrows differently because one of the arrows points to the pre block and the other is just kind of like this kind of, oh, I'm not equivocating arrow. Like I pointed to my previous thing. Great. So somehow, so somehow basically that we have a, this fork choice rule that's literally, literally ghost, basically. Greedy, heaviest observer subtree, where you like go down the subtree that has the most weight uh, according to these like security deposits. And so, and so somehow that, 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 that constrains what is valid in terms of, So that, so that constrains, constrains like what's valid to put here in this block. Because if that block choice here isn't the ghost rule in the justification, then that's an invalid block. And um, you know, so, so, so you, you really, given your justification, you don't have much freedom. As a Byzantine validator, what you get to do is you decide like what do you include in your justification, right? You might be able to omit some messages in order to play games, like choose one fork or the, over another in order to like, you know, bear out your agenda. But somehow, if, if we, we do have safety, then what that means is that there's going to be some amount of security deposits that need to be lost due to, basis, you know, due to equivocation or invalid blocks um, in order to cause a, for, a choice in this fork to uh, you know, be, be, be finalized or to be safe, which means, that it's kind of, which means that if we were to decide on it, then we would, have, we would enjoy consensus safety for that decision. Uh, and so like, that's kind of the blockchain one. And, and, and then finally we have this like super cool one that I'm, that I kind of only came up with a couple weeks ago that I'm like most stoked to talk about. Um, and this basically does an arbitrary reduction system. So here our blocks are gonna have this interesting structure where basically, uh, I'm, 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 I'm gonna just write this in English. So this is like a memoized, mem memoized rewrite. Um, and then and then validator, and then a justification. So this, so the interesting here, the interesting th thing here is that like you're going to have multiple valid choices of what rewrite to do, but it has to be on the best concurrent schedule as seen in the justification. Um, and so we end up doing a very similar thing as we did with the blockchain fork choice. Only instead of choosing a blockchain, we end up choosing between contentious decisions in a concurrent schedule. Um, and, and that ends up being really cool because you, we can write block, blocks concurrently to, the, to, the, to change the state concurrently, not have to agree on the order between them unless they are, they are contentious. And if they're contentious, actually we're gonna be able to see it just by looking at the memoization. Uh, and, and that will help, uh, and that will like kind of feed into this, this fork choice rule process where, you know, uh, well really it's not a fork choice rule, it's, a, it's like a schedule, schedule, concurrent schedule of choice. So you know it's a bit it's a bit cool it's a bit complex but basically like somehow the great thing about all this is all of these protocols have the same slashing conditions they have the same safety proof that they satisfy and um, they, give, they, they give us a lot of room in order to uh, say make trade offs in, in in performance by talking about like how do we recognize safety like if we insist on only recognizing safety in a little subset of classes we can. Um, make sure that this protocol is super performant, but maybe not that live. If we're if we're willing to like run an ideal adversary, which actually turns out to be like a perfect way of implementing a safety oracle, where you see, like simulate the network where everyone is kind of out to get you, and like we'll do the we'll do the worst case thing to change your estimate, then we'll be able to tell in every case, like every day, whether or not we're safe. And that might not be computationally efficient, but we'll end up having much more liveness from from in the sense that like there are more possible states of the protocol that have safety as far as our nodes are, are aware. Um, and, so, and so kind of uh, long story short, um, this, this, this kind of this correct by construction approach is elegant because it lets us uh, derive protocols that sat satisfy a safety proof, basically because what we're doing is we're gonna uh, define protocols that have estimate safety 
and estimate safety is like a rel is like a local view, is a local kind of property, and so therefore is like somewhat easier to reason about. Um, and also, you know, it w one, one, oh, and when we like kind of give our nose the ability to reason about it, um, you know, we can we can we can construct a correct by construction consensus protocol in the sense that like nose actually decide. Um, and then, and then, basically, the the next part of the story is kind of liveness, where basically what we need to do is somehow nodes need to try to plan collectively in order to produce a state of the protocol that does have safety. And the way that that is done is basically, uh, well, there's a tri there's a relatively trivial way to do it, um, and which is basically to say like, okay, this like you basically have a prescribed order of message arrival that you want. Basically, like you know, rounds work perfectly every time and kind of kind of show. Where basically, like if you can get all the all the valid, all the nodes send each other messages in like one round, and then after they all receive them, send each other messages again, then like that will move them into like a safe state. And the nice thing about that is it maps really well onto like traditional consensus protocol kind of literature. But there's lots of other potential states, like for example, potential ways to get safety. Like for example, the blockchain. Like just doing it in a blockchain will also do it eventually. Uh, and like for those ones, for example, are very easy to understand how the liveness strategy looks. Like we know how to make rounds, we know how to make a blockchain from the point of view of um, reasoning about timeouts on the network. Um, because like this is stuff that we've kind of, we get, we get to inherit from, from consensus protocol research and also somehow a blockchain has this very clear synchrony kind of thing, requirement that name, people are able to build the blockchain. Um, so uh, that's kind of like the long and short of the correct by construction Casper protocols that I've been working on. and. You know, it's kind of gotten more exciting than, like, say, like my DevCon talk, because, like, instead of the, just looking at bits, we're now able to look at like other types of data structures within the same kind of framework, with using the same definitions and the same safety proof. So, pretty exciting stuff, I think. Um, you know, I guess we'll open the floor up to questions now. Yeah, hello. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, just, he, he just said that. It's a, it's a, he he um, I thought it was elegant, and I'm flattered. <laughs> so the question is, does the safety estimation proof require an honest reporting? No, it doesn't. It just, re it just relies on a node's local view um, of messages from other nodes, and, the, and, the, and, and it's not the fact that those, it's not honest reporting, it's just, it's just a commitment, right? And if, you, if I have a commitment from you, then like somehow if you violate that commitment, then I can hold you to account. And so it's, it's more about accountability and, and, and observability of faults than about honesty. Well, any message from a validator is a commitment um, because it can be used to hold them to account. Uh, using these slashing conditions. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Uh, mm, so, uh, so estimate safety it, it can be it needs to be calculated locally if a node wants to make a decision. Although the estimate safety just definition is kind of a global definition. Um, the main, uh, so basically like the, but, but the, in terms of whether or not finality is subjective or whether people's thresholds are subjective, that actually ends up fitting quite nicely in here. Where basically like if say the estimate safety oracle says that, you, that like, oh, you can tolerate like X amount of faults, then like maybe um, that's below your finality threshold, then you don't decide. But if it can tolerate X greater than your finality threshold amount of faults, then you can, you know, uh, go for it. And so it, it ends up, you know, it doesn't, conf doesn't conflict but it, uh, actually measuring estimate safety locally is a lot of the kind of challenge for, the, for defining these protocols. But um, very notably, the, how you do that doesn't affect the safety proof. Anyone else? Yeah, hi. Interesting. So, uh, uh, so, I, 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 so, so, uh, when you, so, it, I, I don't even know if I can repeat the question. Do you want? Uh, do you want to try again and see if I can? Uh, so, 
So, so actually here. So I'm basically asking you, like, what is the advantage of having an in-protocol definition of finality when there's a lot of advantages to having, like, each user having their own definition of what they see as safe in a probabilistic, like, finality, like, after X amount of blocks, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this is final, therefore I'm willing to accept this as, as finality. So, so, uh, so, that, so, that's, so that's a great, great question. So the question is, like, you know, why, why do we want to have, like, you know, this kind of safety uh, kind of calculation in the protocol? Uh, rather than like letting nodes have kind of subjective decisions based on their own, um, you know, their their own kind of view, and I guess I don't need to replay, repeat the question now, anyways. Uh, 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 so so basically, the, the, there's a co so uh, to some extent, it's absolutely totally cool for people to have their own di different safety calculations as long as they're reliably detecting safety, because like as long as you're reliably detecting safety, then you get to benefit from this proof. But if you think you're safe but you're not, you don't, right? And so, and so somehow the reliability of the safety proof is, is really kind of required. The other thing to note is that actually none of this stuff that I described is probabilistic. Only really in the proof of work model is it pro have, have I really talked about or alluded to probabilistic kind of reasoning. Um, or like, you know, tangentially like would have touched upon. Um, so somehow um, the, the safety calculations aren't deterministic. Sorry, they aren't necessarily probabilistic. They could be. And if you can make a probabilistic safety calculation, which you kind of show is actually faithful safety calculation, then there's no reason why you can't run your node like that. And, th and that's actually, I think, quite cool because it lets us have kind of a modularity and complexity kind of at changing at the edges of the protocol rather than at the core. But on the same, at, the same, at, the same, at the same time, we do need to ship some kind of safety oracle or, other, or else people aren't going to have any idea of where they're safe without, until they like come up with their own or like find one that they like. And so we do need to we do need to ship something. Just just like for example, the validator strategy, like technically, like don't technically, like you know, they, we could we, they, we could accept and tolerate them to modify it within some bounds as long as they achieve protocol guarantees, you know. But we, we still need to ship some default behavior. We can't like ship the incentives alone. We need to ship the incentives and a strategy. Um, otherwise, uh, people won't know what to do. Um, yeah, good question. What's the biggest challenge you currently face in terms of um, implementing the Casper protocol on the public chain? I mean, what's the biggest challenge I currently face implementing Casper on public chain? The sound, okay, great, because I was going to say, like, I'm not, I'm not a developer. Um, I mean, maybe, so let's, let's throw this a call. Um, biggest challenge is probably um, being sure that when you deploy on a public chain, which is securing a massive amount of value, that you're not going to deploy something and like tell everyone, this is OK, and it's not OK. And then you lose a lot of people, a lot of money, and get people very stressed out. And so we have to stress out, especially Vlad, and Vlad has talked about this, stress out a lot about this kind of like massive scale and trying to design protocols that really scale up. Um, so I would say like, I mean, the public part, but yeah. Hopefully it helps, yeah. Um, cool, um, yeah. Um, yeah, sure, so I mean like we, the question is that kind of describe the deployment and basically we have this Casper finality gadget, uh, which we're gonna deploy kind of ASAP. And then, you know, we have like, Maybe some like like maybe we want to do some sharding real quick to kind of let, let the load keep the load off. But basically, like I would like to see all you know all this stuff implemented and like you know some of it maybe deployed to main But but honestly, like to me, this is I'm I'm I'm, I'm like a researcher. You know I'm not like I'm not going to be upset if like this protocol as is doesn't get onto the main chain. But if it does, like that would be great. Um, and so I guess like so the, in the short term the, the everything's the timeline is quite clear. In the long term, like we're, we still have like lots of discussions to have about like what Casper 2.0 looks like. Um, yeah. Well.
So the question is like, okay, how do we like continue to make sure in the future that we tap into the various ex fields of expertise that are re required in order to kind of make this a success, build it out? Well, so I mean, I, I, on one hand, uh, I would hope that the output of this process will be like, you know, some like proofs and stuff that can be checked rather without no needing to know everything. Um, but uh, definitely, like you know, uh, the, the getting academics interested in these problems, framing the problems in a way that academics can easily come on board and solve a well-defined, closed problem that will like is like kind of works for them is a challenge. And but it's totally something that like we're, we're working on. I mean, basically, like in the end, I think what we're going to end up seeing is like papers published and like you know like in relevant places, and like you know which I think will eventually. Uh, provide people with confidence that like we aren't just doing pie in the sky stuff, but stuff that actually like contributes to like existing like thought. Um, so there is there is like a, a we are working on like a kind of documentation for some of the research problems that we have, um, and which we use to like talk to like show various kind of academics and experts. Um, it's still work in progress, but. You know, the, 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 these are some problems that we deal with on a actually relatively regular basis. One of the reasons why I travel around so much is like I'm trying, trying to convince these people to uh, take an interest in like our, our, our kind of mechanism design applied distributed systems kind of problems. Yeah. How much does the Ethereum Foundation spend on research and development? I don't know. I mean, I'm not the guy. Uh, we don't, we have, I think we have like less than 10 researchers, so. Uh, maybe ballpark it from that. Yeah. Oh, I, I really one of my many reading debts. I mean, I love Ghost, so I'm sure that Spectre is great. I mean, just from the reputation of the authors, but uh, I haven't looked at it. But I have. Uh, have you? Is it awesome? Oh yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. So so uh, basically, we're just, just describing Spectre, which is this protocol by Aviv Zohar and Jonathan Zamblowski again. I'm not sure who the other co-authors are. Jonathan. Okay. Cool. And so uh, and, and and it sounds to me like it's kind of like an inclusive ghost where you get to kind of do a bunch of uh, uh, execute transactions even if they're on different forks as long as they're not conflicting. Which is something that, and I'm assuming that the fork with more weight will have priority, and so like that, that's totally interesting to me. I totally have looked at that kind of thing, and, but basically it's one of those like you know, um, second protocol rather than first protocol type stories. Yeah. Can I explain the fourth condition of the rewrite? What do you mean the fourth condition? You mean you mean the data structure? Okay. Um, Sure. So let's let's. Do you want to flip it around? Come back. Okay. No, no. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. You got to pull on the thing underneath. Okay. So so basically, uh, the it's it's okay, Carl. Don't worry about it. Um, um. So basically, the way to think about the rewrite thing is 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 kind of kind of like this. So here's here's the way I like thinking about it. So we start off with with some last finalized frontier, and then every rewrite is going to take some piece of it, maybe maybe one of them will take like this piece, and then kind of, you know, I'll write a, write a new a new a new a new. Let me get rid of all this. So it kind of will take a piece of it and kind of overwrite this piece, and like replace it with that piece. Maybe another rewrite will like will will take like will overwrite this piece and that piece, and uh, you know uh, like uh, leave a new piece kind of here. And like that piece is just kind of gone now, like now there's like no piece there. Um, so so somehow re uh, these these and then and then maybe I'll have like another rewrite rule that like takes a piece of this one and a piece of that one and like produces some new state up here. And so it's it's, it's kind of a slightly weird situation where uh, rather than every block having like a single previous block, it has a, uh, it has previous rewrites that it overwritten overwrote. And so how every block is memoized with the rewrites that is uh, over that overwrote, and somehow it's only valid if, or is only valid if the, uh, in the best schedule in its justification, each of those things that it over overwrote are actually exposed, i.e., they don't actually have like some like some block on top that already overwrote overwrote them, 
And so somehow, you know, you end up, we end up like building this, this crazy thing. Um, you know, who knows, I'm, I'm just I'm gonna, and, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then where each one of these things are kind of blocks and they point to some other number, some number of, some number of blocks. You can see like, say like a bunch of them going on here by, and before like, for, before coming, like syncing up again. Somehow we end up with this DAG of rewrites where every rewrite points to the rewrite that's overriding and, and kind of it results in a new piece of the frontier which is kind of like the current state of the protocol, which can be overwritten by these rewrite rules, assuming you know that a best schedule kind of sees that sees that frontier. And so we get end up having a DAG with with these kind of puzzle pieces that correspond to the uh, you know the pre that the over overwrites that are being overwritten. Um, and 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 somehow, if two blocks overwrite the same state or like over the same the same kind of spot, then they're in contention, and 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 we need to pick between them. So it might be that like I have another one here, um, and, 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 and these two are, these, these two kind of are, are, are kind of in, they're kind of in, they're kind of like really like only one of them can really be, right? And then so like based on everyone's latest messages, you can figure out which one has more weight and like pick one of them in order to drive this kind of best schedule type story. Um, and so basically we end up having like a, a, imagine that a blockchain is like a puzzle where every block fits on top of the previous one because it has like a hash, which is the hash of the previous one. Only here, instead of having one previous block, we have like n previous blocks, which are like the n that are being overwritten by this rewrite, rewrite rule. Um, and we kind of get, we can identify contention based on uh, whether or not these puzzles can possibly each fit. Uh, because if they fit in the same spot, then somehow uh, th there's there's like a contention between them, and and so basically, in some way, a blockchain is like a, a an instance of this type of rule, uh, but this is m also kind of more powerful because it lets you do kind of concurrent uh, rewrites, um, and and you know at this point it's still kind of new research. I don't know that this is the best way to draw it, but uh, you know I'm sure it's all going to come 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 in time. Yeah, so something I haven't mentioned about all of this and brought up that is, that is that with all of these protocols that have this tie-breaking property, where basically I just kind of uh, assert that any two sets of validators have different weights. Uh, and there's lots of ways to kind of guarantee this. Um, but basically, uh, what, it, what, it, what it means is that like, we're never going to get to one of these points and be like, oh no, there's the same amount of weight on each side. Like, it's always going to be broken by like, at least a random epsilon. And so somehow, um, we, we don't have to deal with like an edge case where there's an, ar where there's an arbitrary choice. Uh, and that also, you know, is, it, like it really is for every one of these protocols, like from the binary down to the rewrite system replication. Um, and the cool thing about the rewrite system thing is that like, you know, you can write any fully unambiguously specified programming language or virtual machine in terms of state rewrites. Um, and so it ends up being a pretty, pretty general thing like, you know, as general as computation. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's a good question. Where am, where am I documenting this? So I'm, so, so I'm, embarrassingly, I'm embarrassingly behind. I've got, I've got like some incomplete paper documenting the binary consensus. I think that now though, I've, I, I've gotten to a point where I'm better able to like factor things. And, and, and I'm also getting like starting to get help from people who like enjoy writing papers. I enjoy doing research. But I am, I am working on uh, documenting. It is one of the responsibilities that I have, and I apologize for not living up to it. Anyone else? So, so the new sort of how do you, how do you address rewrites deal with, with, with partitions? Interesting, yeah. So, so, so definitely, like, there is some extent to which we won't need to agree on which fork to choose if they're affecting only independent states. And so that can help a lot um, in rewrites, but in the, in, if there is a contention, then like we're gonna get the same type of story as normal where like uh, the contention is gonna be resolved in favor of like one of the partitions. Um, but the nice thing actually, something that Carl mentioned earlier and that I haven't stressed enough is that like actually calculating safety of particular estimates that only refer to some substate of the state it could actually potentially be really elegant where basically you say, oh look, my, my, my state of the state of this account is finalized, even though maybe some other things are still in contention over on some other piece of the state. Um, 
but yeah, no, this is this is this is this is kind of kind of still bleeding edge research. Like, don't expect this to be deployed anytime soon. Um, cool. So, uh, are, are we out of time? Are we good? We're, we ran 15 minutes over, I think. So. Cool. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.